Welcome to Inspire Campfire. I am your host, Scott Wurzbacher. Now, if you're a return listener, you might be wondering what the heck happened to the voiceover that usually precedes each episode. If this is your first time listening, well, you see, we have this awesome, very professional voice that gets every episode started. Now, here's the thing. Would you rather listen to a recording of your favorite music group or see them live? Because today we have the man behind the voice that kicks off each and every episode with us. Kevin Schoolcraft is that man. Today's Hello. episode will include stories of extraordinary adventure, Kevin's stories. And we might even find out how he got into doing voiceover. But today is really special because we're also going to talk about synchronicity, friendship, and a reminder that you just never know how a stranger can unexpectedly come into your life and radically impact its trajectory. It's also a reminder that we never know how our journey might be impacting those with whom we come into contact. So with that, Kevin Schoolcraft, welcome to the campfire. Well, thank you. Good to be here. All right, Kevin. So before we jump in, can we have a live Kevin Schoolcraft podcast intro? Sure. Welcome to Inspire Campfire, a podcast where ordinary people tell their stories of extraordinary adventure. These are campfire stories meant to inspire the rest of us to light the fire within, get outside, follow our dreams, and return to tell our own stories. Ready? Let's strike the match. Oh my, I got I got to applause. That I <laughs> I love <laughs> I love it so much. That is so awesome. So like the conversation about how you got into voiceover, I don't I don't even think that that needs an introduction. You you absolutely have a gift. And um so for the listeners, Kevin, I before we jump in, I just want to give everybody a little bit of quick context. Because you and I have known each other for about 20 years. Mm -hmm. And the way that we met was that my father and I were actually just sitting on the first tee box at a golf course in Charlotte, North Carolina, getting ready to tee off. And you walked up as a single and just uh, joined us for a round of golf. And over those 18 holes, we just had a blast. We just in immediately connected, just hit it off. Um, you're a much better golfer than I am, but uh, that's okay. We, we, <laughs> we, we, I, I learned a lot from you that day, but um, at the end of the round, it was just kind of one of those things where we exchanged contact information. I think we got together for a beer or something a couple of times afterwards, and uh, just this friendship was born, and there's been so many things that have happened since then, and uh, it's just, it's, it's hysterical that, that now here you are on this podcast, and you're the voice that kicks off every episode, and I'm just, I'm just thrilled to call you friend. Oh, that's very kind of you. You never know who you're going to meet on a golf course. It's a, it's a great place to, to just go sometimes as a single. And sometimes you get paired up with some crazy people and <laughs> you can't get out of there fast enough. And other times you meet somebody who is, ends up a lifelong friend. So it's a great sport for that. No, no doubt at all. So here's the funny thing. 20 years ago when you and I met, it, it wasn't, it wasn't um, too long before that encounter on the golf course that I had learned about this man named John Goddard. And uh, he lived from 1924 to 2013. And when he was age 15, he wrote this list of 127 goals that he wanted to accomplish during his life. And it included these crazy things like climbing different mountains, exploring rivers on, on different continents, flying an airplane. And uh, if you read the story about him, he was quoted as the real life Indiana Jones. And uh, so around that time, I developed my own list and I created a vision board and just kind of started coming up with a thing, few things that I wanted to do. And then in comes Kevin Schoolcraft into my life. And one of my first experiences with you um, after the golf and after we kind of got to know each other a little bit was uh, coming to one of your, I think it was a birthday party or a Halloween party. And you had the most unbelievable, authentic <laughs> Indiana Jones costume. <laughs> and, and I'm like, man, this is the real life Indiana Jones. And you've had a lifetime of not just uh, exploration adventures, but 
um, different career adventures as well. And, uh, and it's just been super, super inspiring to watch. And so I'm, I'm just excited to talk about some of your, your life stories and, and your adventures that, sh- that you've had, because I think you are, uh, you're the legacy of John Goddard. <laughs> well, that's funny. Uh, you know, it was, it was, it's my favorite movie of all time, Raiders of the Lost Ark. When I was a kid, I saw it seven times in the movie theater. So, you know, for that Halloween party, when we decided to dress up, I'm one of those, I'm either all in a hundred percent or not at all. So when I, when I decided I was going to dress up like Indiana Jones, I actually somehow managed to track down the guy who made Harrison Ford's actual jacket for the movie and had him make one for me. He's a guy from London in the UK. Uh, and so that, that was kind of the genesis of the outfit and it went from there and, you know, spent way too much money making a, a Halloween costume, but, uh, that was one of my favorites. It was, it was so good. And, uh, so we'll have some pictures of you in the show notes that people can check out, but, um, yeah, it, and obviously that it, it touched me as well because it, it Raiders of the Lost Ark was one of my childhood favorites as well. And Harrison Ford and of course Han Solo and Indiana Jones are both two of my, my greatest idols from my childhood. Um, but Kevin, let's let's talk about your Goddard's list and some of the things that that you've some of your adventures that you've done. What are what are um, what are a couple of the favorite adventures that you've had over the course of your life? Uh, well, you know, it, I guess inspired by that movie, I, you know, I always thought being an archaeologist had to be a really cool job. But then you, <laughs> you find out it's really not like that. Uh, had it been like that, I probably would have wanted to be an archaeologist. But going and seeing things, traveling to places, doing things that not many people have done, um, whether it's alone or with others, you know, kind of check off that list, you know, really crazy stuff. You know, skydiving, I did that for a while and, and got into climbing and you know, climbing has, has been and hiking has been a big thing uh, for me over the years. Cycling, I had a neighbor who got me into cycling and that t- turned into you know, riding in the French Alps while the Tour de France was there. And um, so I, I've been very fortunate and been able to do some some pretty crazy uh, stuff and, and have some really good times. You, you are absolutely somebody that goes all in and the Indiana Jones costume is just kind of scratching the surface. But like, <laughs> well, I guess let's start with the mountaineering because what's cool about that is that, again, right around the time that you and I first started getting to know each other, um, and I think it was you that inspired me to climb Mount Rainier. Mm-hmm. And uh, so me and a couple of buddies went out to Mount Rainier and, and attempted. We didn't get to the top because there was weather. But uh, but I remember coming over to your house and because this is something that you had done. And mm-hmm. uh, so you'd had some some pretty awesome experiences uh, on Mount Rainier. And, and uh, I think you you actually trained with some, uh, some pretty high profile people. I'd love to hear about that. Yeah, it was, uh, it was really almost kind of on a dare. I I went to a wedding. I grew up in Ohio, so I had never seen a a snow-capped mountain in my life. And I went to a wedding for a relative in the state of Washington, lived in Seattle and Mount Rainier was the first snow-capped mountain I'd ever seen in my life. And I was, uh, a girl I was dating was with me we went to the wedding together and I remember standing there and seeing the, the mountain for the first time. And I said, wow, I, I would love to, to climb that and stand on that one day. And she actually laughed at me <laughs> and so, because she knew I had never, you know, I grew up in Ohio, everything's flat. There were no mountains. And so that was kind of the inspiration. And I said, you know what, I'm going to do it. And it was about a year later where I made my first attempt. I trained for about a year and I, you know, I, I was going to graduate school at Ohio State at the time, and it was one of those, it was before kind of the craziness that you have now where everything's kind of sealed off and you, know, you can't get, you could actually go into Ohio Stadium back then, into the horseshoe, and run the track or run the stairs or whatever you want to do, all the students would go do it. So I would put on a 35-pound pack of concrete, I had a backpack, and I would put quickcrete in there and put 35 pounds, and I would run every step in Ohio stadium. And I would do that every single week, two, three times a week to try and train. Cause I had never climbed a mountain. I had no idea what you did. I didn't even own a backpack. Um, so I was scared to death and I trained for about a year and went out there, um, the first time in 1993. And 
took climbing lessons in Columbus with a, a guy who worked at a local store called the Benchmark, and his name was Andy Politz. And I didn't realize it at the time, but it turned out he is a world class mountaineer, and I had no idea. I just thought it was some guy who worked at this store. Yeah, he was amazing, and so did lessons with him. Went out there, and it was a situation where we tried to do a uh, a route up the Emmons Glacier on Mount Rainier and got to nine, ten thousand feet. It was a week long expedition we were doing with you know seventy five pound packs, and ended up getting stuck in a whiteout for three days in the tent and, and the weather was ridiculous. And I had no idea what I was doing. I thought I was going to die. I'm, you know, in the tent in a fetal position, curled up, listening to the avalanches rip off all over the place, wondering yeah. if they're going to come sweep you off the mountain. Um, and interestingly, the, there was a young kid who was one of our guides. We had two, three guides on that trip. And one of them was a young kid. I think he was 17, 18 years old by the name of Jake Norton, who number two guy who would go on to be an unbelievable world-class mountaineer. And I had no idea. So I've, I've, I got paired up with Andy Politz to, to train and, and then Jake Norton and Jake Norton. One time we, we left this campground at 4,500 feet and we were going up to 60 something hundred feet. And we did that. And, in, and on the way, one of the, the guests, their back started to hurt. And so they couldn't go on. They had to return. So we're at 60 something hundred feet. And this guest has to be returned back to 40 something hundred feet. So Jake takes his own pack and takes this guy's pack and walks him all the way back down. At the same time, he leaves to go from 60 something hundred down to 40 something hundred. We leave to go up to 9,300, hmm. which is an all day kind of climb. And so we're doing this and we get to 9,300 feet, Camp Sherman. And I kid you not, 15 minutes later after we arrive, here comes Jake just strolling up. He had taken this guy all the way down with two backpacks, dropped the guy off and come up from 4,000 feet all the way to 9,000 feet. And we only beat him by 15 minutes. I mean, this kid yeah. was unbelievable. And today, if you go look him up, Jake Norton, he's a he's an incredible mountaineer and a really great guy and um, truly an impressive uh, adventure guy. Um, but so that kind of led to the mountain climbing because I didn't make it the first time, uh, went back again in 97 uh, and tried the West side road route. And that turned into, uh, it, it actually was too nice in, in Seattle at that time. And the, the mountain had warmed up and a giant Serac had fallen down our route. So fortunately we weren't standing on the route at the time and mm. we ended up turning around, uh, at around 11,000 feet. So it wasn't until 1999, it took me three attempts to finally summit Rainier. And then in between, I, I kind of started that, that path of trying to, initially I wanted to climb, you know, the seven summits, but right. when you get married and you have kids that kind of <laughs> eventually falls away. And then it turned into the, you know, the high point of every state in the United States. And I've done, I think 24 of them. But again, life kind of stalls out some of that stuff. So, hey, it ain't over. But twenty four is a good start. You're you're uh, one away from halfway. <laughs> one away, yeah. There's there's some funny ones. It's a anyone who wants to start climbing, it's a fun way to do it because you know it's a goal. You can take a picture, and I, I sent you a bunch of those pictures. Some of them are as funny as driving up in your car in Florida and, and hopping out of the car and taking a picture next to the monument <laughs> in the highest point in Florida. The high and point others, in Florida. Yeah. What, how, how high is the high point in Florida? It's, I, I can't remember the exact number. It's probably something like 300 feet. I mean, it's, it's literally, you get out of the car and you're standing next to the, the monument or the sign and you take a picture and there's several in the United States like that. Uh, but then you have, you know, real mountains like Rainier and, and Mount Hood and Granite and, and some of the stuff in the, the Western mountains. Yeah. I, I love that. And so what, what was, was Rainier your favorite? Probably because it was my, was my first and it's, you know, out of all the ones I've done, it's really the only, I would call serious mountain. And you end up meeting all these people who are world-class mountaineers that, that train on there and are guides with, uh, you know, Rainier Mountaineering. Um, so it's, it's really unique. And it, one of my guides on the 1997 trip was a guy by the name of Tap Richards. 
And so I, I mention all these guys because in, I think it was 1999 when there was an expedition on Mount Everest to find uh, Mallory and Irvine, who were the first people that perhaps summited Everest in 1924. Uh, no one knows because they, they were seen heading toward the summit and then never seen again. So they put together a big expedition on Everest to go try and find any evidence if those folks had, had ever made it or not. They were looking for maybe the camera that Irvine had, and they ended up finding George Mallory's body frozen in the, in, you know, on Mount Everest. Oh, wow. And three of the five guys that found his body were Andy Pollitz, Jake Norton and Tab Richards, guys that I had climbed with. And so it just kind of crazy that you end nothing, up meeting people like the best that. for Kevin Schoolcraft. <laughs> <laughs> I had no idea. That's awesome. So for those that don't know, um, I think the 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 books say that Sir Edmund Hillary was the first to summit Mount Everest, but uh, it's controversial because it could be that Mallory did. Uh, he just didn't make it back. So we don't know for sure, right? Yep. Yeah. So, so speaking of which, um, I, I just have to tell you, like, so you inspired me to go after Rainier and, um, then a good friend of mine, Taylor Grist, he got the bug because of my trip and he actually went on to climb a whole bunch of other mountains, including Mount Everest. And he wow. is episode four. So, um, episode four, Taylor talks about his story and, and I think your men, your name is mentioned in there as, you know, as part of that circle. So it's just, you know, the synchronicities of, of how all of this happens. And then, uh, Derek Wood, who was episode nine, and he talks about the Pacific crest trail. Um, he was tent, tent mates with Taylor on Everest. And so, um, so it's just a cool wow. thing, Kevin, because there's this, this synchronicity, like this chance encounter playing golf 20 years ago, kind of set this whole thing into motion. And, and now here we are on this podcast. It's just a pretty special thing. And so, you know, again, the point being, you just never know who you're going to come in contact with and how you're going to impact other people's lives. It's, it's pretty cool. And I'll just publicly here, thank you for that inspiration that you gave me and so many others. It's crazy. You know, the butterfly effect. You know, totally. Something so, that you think is completely inconsequential and it, it ends up being uh, some important piece of history to someone. Um, and changes, you know, there's been a lot of people that have either climbed with me, uh, that I kind of dragged them along these excursions and, and then they've gone on to climb a lot more mountains than I ever did. Uh, I've had a couple of folks like that where, you know, they, they hear the story and they're like, oh, wow, that'd be kind of cool. And you're like, come on, and you, you get them out there. And next thing you know, they're addicted to it. And they're going on. I, I know a guy that, gosh, he climbed, uh, several of the seven summits, um, and it's because you, you just never know. You kind of get hooked on that stuff. And it's a it's a really fun adventure. It, it is. And, and I totally feel you on that. So, um, you know, just jump back to Mount Rainier because it's really funny the way that you described it. You just stood there and looked at the mountain and you said, wow, I want to climb that. And mm -hmm. I had the exact same experience. Um, my wife and I saw Mount Rainier for the first time on a road trip across country when we were first out of college. I didn't climb it then, but I just, the majesty of that, that, that mountain, uh, when you're there in person, but also when you're in Seattle and you're looking back at it, it's just, it's, it's, it creates this feeling of awe. Um, and then we went back and I think we did a cruise to Alaska at one point and, uh, it left out of Seattle. So of course, um, we, we did a little day trip and went over to Mount Rainier then. And I think it was then that I was like, I'm, I'm climbing this mountain. And uh, of course I came back, but my question for you though, is, your, your words were, wow, I want to climb that. And I want to go to that, like that feeling, like, can you just talk more about that? Wow. And like, what happened, like what happens inside you when you, when you're standing in front of a mountain like that and what, you know, yes, it's beautiful, but what is that thing that nudges you to like actually want to climb it? That's a great question. You know, it was, I don't know if it's because I, I grew up on the East coast or in the Midwest and in Ohio and had never seen anything like that. You see pictures of it. You might see some stuff on TV, although, you know, way back then you didn't have high definition TV where you could really see what something looked like. It was, you know, a grainy little black and white television. And so you, you stand there and you just can't believe that something like that exists if you've never seen it. Mm -hmm. And the way 
particularly Rainier, kind of floats on the horizon when you're standing in Seattle and you know that it's hours and hours away, but yet it looks enormous. And it, it, there's just something, and I don't know that I could put my finger on it, what exactly it is, but it's something that you just, it makes you go, I have got to see that. I have got to, to get on it. I've got to, I want to see what the view is from the top of that because it has to be amazing. And, you know, I, I grew up kind of hunting and fishing and stuff. And the funny thing about all the hunting and fishing when I grew up as a kid is I really didn't care about the hunting part of it. I liked the outdoors part of it, you know, hiking around and being in the woods and all that. And, when you get out to the Pacific Northwest and, and Rainier and that area and the Cascades, it's so unbelievably beautiful that it looks like a fairy tale land. It looks like something you've seen in a book when you were a kid. And it, it's hard to believe that it's real. And as you get closer to the mountain and you keep getting closer and you drive and you catch glimpses of it on the road through the trees and you just, I don't know, there's something about it. It's just this crazy pull that makes you say, I, I, I've got to do that. The crazy pull. It is a crazy yeah. pull. It is. And it, you know, and then it becomes somewhat of an obsession, particularly if you, if you don't make it like we didn't the first two times and you, you know, it, it took seven years, but I kept going back because I, I just got to do it. And I've known several people that have gone out there for whatever reason, whether, or, you know, they, they weren't in, in the right kind of condition or they got hit by, um, you know, high altitude sickness and they had to come back and instead of being defeated, they're even more determined. I got to get back there and do it again. Yeah. Is it, is it, um, is there like an element of like proving to yourself that you can, or what, what do you, cause yeah. you went back three times. I mean, yeah, I, I definitely think that. And for whatever reason, you know, I, I think there are certain kind of people that are drawn to sports that have some sort of physicality of suffering. And, you know, the reality is a lot of mountaineering is suffering. And the other sport that I tend to be drawn to is cycling and that's suffering as well. And both of those are almost kind of a lonely existence where it's step after step after step up that mountain in silence and cycling is the same way. You're kind of, seeing how far you can push your body, um, Mm. wanting to challenge yourself to, I can do this, you know, one more step, one more step. And for both of those sports, I think it becomes much more of a mental grind than a physical one. I mean, certainly the physical part of it is there, but it becomes much more mentally challenging to me as you're climbing up, you know, just thousands and thousands of the same step after step. And same with cycling up a, you know, a mountain in the Alps. It's just a continual grind of suffering. And and people say, why do you you chase sports like that where you suffer? And I I don't have a good answer. (laughs) I just, it's for whatever, you know, sick reason I'm drawn to those. And and there's certainly a, a greater feeling of accomplishment. I think when you finally do achieve that, you know, when you get to the top of that mountain and there is something to see. And you have done something that not everyone has had the chance to do. And you get to see things that not everyone has the chance to see. Can you describe that feeling of accomplishment when you get to the summit? (sighs) You know, the funny thing is on, on like Rainier, it's less a feeling of accomplishment when you do get there, because my mind is already thinking about, okay, now I got to get down. (laughs) <laughs> yeah, because the world is is full of mountaineers who who've summited a lot of mountains, but as you know, Mallory and Irvine can tell you, not everyone comes back. And right, and what's the old saying? Getting to the top is optional; getting back down is mandatory. Yeah. So, I instead of being elated and and you know, oh, this is the greatest thing ever, I immediately the brain starts thinking about, okay, now we got to get down. I got to have this much energy. I got to you know make sure to eat. I got to. And it becomes like this methodical thought process of, of getting down safely. I mean, Kevin, like profound. So you, you're subjecting yourself to suffering to go after this feeling of accomplishment. 
So the goal is to get to the top. And as soon as you get to the top, you're like, okay, done. Let's get back down safely. Yeah. It's, it's bizarre. And I don't know that everyone else is like that, but for me, that that's what it's like. I remember one time my, my younger brother, Corey, who's 20 years younger than me. We, uh, I got him into climbing and doing some of these high points with me. And when he was young, I can't remember how old he was, 13, 14 years old, 15, maybe we went out to Utah to do King's peak, which is a really long hike in, I want to say it's probably a 20 mile hike into that summit, very remote wilderness. And we were going up and it's a real rocky kind of traverse as you're, you're getting near the top of the mountain and it started snowing and this was the middle of summer and, mm -hmm. and it was a pretty hard snow. And it was one of those situations where, yeah, we're 500 feet away. We could get there, but I got a, you know, a young kid with me and what if the kid breaks an ankle? And that's what's going through my head instead sure. of, you know, Hey, let's get the summit. It's geez, Louise, if he breaks an ankle, we're 30 miles away from anywhere on the top of a mountain and it's snowing. So we turned around 500 feet below the summit. And wow. for me, it's not always about getting to the summit. It's the whole experience of putting yourself through that, you know, and when you're 500 feet below the summit, yeah, you know, physically I could get there at this point, but is it the smart thing to do? Is it the safe thing to do? And um, to me, it wasn't about checking off, you know, the top of that summit. And it was about the whole journey of getting there and the journey of getting back safely and, and just, you know, being part of it all. It's about the journey you just said. I love it. Because here's the thing, and I've been thinking about this, actually spending some time randomly thinking about like this this concept of like uh, uh, peak experiences and, and peak um, peak performance. And the thing about a peak is when you get there, you immediately turn around and come back down. Mm -hmm. so, you know, it, it's it's not necessarily about being in peak peak fitness or having that peak experience all the time. It's like that becomes the goal. You go after it and then you immediately turn around and come back down. But like the joy and the and the and the and the the fun of it is all in and that feeling of accomplishment. It's all in that walk up. Oh, and then, absolutely. And then yeah. The, and you know, part of it for me is uh, physically I'm kind of lazy by nature. So I need to have a goal. If I want to mm -hmm. stay in shape, I need to have a goal. I need to have something that I'm training for to motivate me to get off the couch and, and do whatever. And then I'm, you know, I'm that obsessive compulsive where once I have the goal, then I'm going to, I'm going to kill myself training for it. But it's that process of going through that, you know, however long a period of time you're training, whether it's three months or like the first time I did Rainier where it was a year because I was so scared and I had no idea what to expect Yeah, that, you know, that process of going through that and that entire training um, was the satisfying part and knowing that you did it, you committed to that training and you, you accomplished getting to the point where you're ready for whatever the adventure is. Um, that to me is also part of the goal. It's not just climbing Rainier, it's training for that period of time and, and doing all of the things that you said you're going to do to get ready for that. And then in, you're kind of at the whim of the mountain, right? I mean, you've been there and the weather turns, there's nothing you can do, but you know that, look, I put in the time, I did what I had to do. I was physically and mentally ready to do this. And that to me is a big accomplishment as part of the whole challenge, not just summiting the mountain. Yeah. So the training is actually, that's, I mean, that's part of the journey and that's Maybe we, maybe we don't talk about that so much, but that's like part of why we do it because that's yes. a part of the whole experience. Yeah, and, because as much suffering as there is on the mountain or on the bike when you're climbing a, a mountain on a bike, it's all of the prep work that went into it that was suffering too. Yeah. And sometimes that suffering is a lot worse because you're, you're on a trainer in, in the middle of a gym just you know putting in mile after mile or you're running stairs on a, you know, in a, in a stadium, just looking at the same step over and over and over as you run there's, there's no real satisfaction, you know, visually, it's not like you're standing on a mountain and you're suffering, but you have this great view. It's you're putting in the work and, and that's part of the satisfaction for me, I think. Yeah. And I, so one thing you said that I just wanted to come back to really quick was you said, I'm lazy by nature and I, and I relate cause I feel that too. So, but yeah. what's so interesting about it is like, why not just be lazy? 
Like if we're lazy by nature, why not we just just embrace the lazy? Oh, I don't know. That's a great question. You know, if I could eat donuts and pizza all day and <laughs> and magically stay in shape, I would do it. <laughs> but I can't. So I have to find something to motivate me to to keep myself in shape. And you know, if you're gonna if you're gonna be working out every day or on the treadmill or whatever it is that you do to get in shape, if you're gonna do that every day, why not at least do it for some reason. Yeah. So I need a reason. And that reason is I'm getting ready for a mountain or I'm, you know, doing a bike race or a charity ride or whatever it happens to be um, that motivates you. So climbing the mountain is, is not really the purpose. It's the goal. And they're two different things. The purpose really is to give yourself an excuse to go through that journey. Yeah, I think so. Yeah, I think so. And you know, there's, there's so much more that you get out of it just then you know, standing on the top of the mountain, there's all the people that you bring along with you that like you, that get inspired to, to kind of go do something fun like that yourself. And, you know, to see people's faces the first time you take them out to a place like that, and, and they see it, and they're like, holy cow, we're climbing that. Yeah, um, it, it, it's, it really is awesome. And we use that word on this podcast. And we actually um, I, I've asked a number of people to, to talk about experiences of awe that they've had. And, um, I just love that word. It's, you know, it's part of the word awesome, which gets thrown around so much, but if you look it up in the dictionary, um, dictionary says it's a feeling of reverential respect mixed with fear or wonder. And I think you've described that beautifully. Oh so, yeah. The, <laughs> the fear is a big part of it. I mean, yeah. like the first time I went and, and we were snowed in and I was fearful because I had no idea what was going on. And you hear avalanches, it's the middle of the night and you just don't know what's happening. Yeah. And then there were other times like in 97 where you're on a knife edge Ridge where you have one leg on one side of the mountain and one leg on the other side of the mountain going up this knife edge. And it's a thousand foot drop this way. And it's a 2000 foot drop this way. And you're like, Holy cow, what am I doing? You're scared to death. <laughs> right. And you just luckily you have great guides and you know they take care of you and they, you know, make sure that you're ready for that and they you know secure you in and you're roped up and everything. But mentally getting yourself to put that next foot forward when you're scared to death and you're yeah. like, holy cow, this could this could not end well. That's a good time not to listen to the inner critic. Would you say that? Oh yeah. Yeah. <laughs> because you can you know, there are, we, we did one where we have to be climbing kind of up a waterfall, you know, as the snow is melting and you're climbing rock and you, you've got your crampons and your ice axe and you're, you're trying to go up and you're roped to someone else above you and roped to someone else below you. And you're thinking, my goodness, if that person above me does something wrong, it's going to take the whole rope team off the mountain and it's a 900 foot drop. And if you, if you think about that too much, you become just so petrified that at least for me, I wouldn't be able to move. I, I would freeze. And you just got to kind of work through that and get past yeah. it and not think about it and just keep going. Yeah. I mean, it's no joke. You guys are, you got ice axes and you got crampons and, you know, ropes and the whole nine. I mean, you, your focus is just present moment, one step at a time. Yeah. Yeah. Well, awesome, man. I, so I, I want to just, um, pivot for a second, because one of the questions that I ask everybody on this podcast has to do about uh, movies and actors. And so before I ask you the question, I, ha I have to stop because, you know, we talked about your Indiana Jones costume. Mm -hmm. So you've been Harrison Ford, um, but have. you also have You've also had some other really awesome costumes. Like some of my most favorite were um, you went all out as Neo and your wife was Trinity from the Matrix. That was a beaut. That was an awesome yeah. one. That was a good one. Um, Charlie Sheen, the wild thing. And yeah. man, I'm a Cleveland you're, boy. <laughs> you're, and uh, Hugh Jackman as Wolverine. That was, a, that was an amazing costume. And um what were some of the other ones? Uh, Clint Eastwood. Uh, John Snow from uh, Game of Thrones. Yeah. Uh, um, Clint so Eastwood, you, The Good, The Bad, and The Ugly. It's another, The Good, The Bad, and The Ugly. That's what that was, the Clint Eastwood, yeah. So you go all out with these costumes. Like, so what? what is it about stepping into um, those personas that just gets you so excited? Cause I, I, I can see the passion in you and I just, I love how, how all out you go. Like, what is it about stepping into those personas? 
you know, it's it's just fun. Those are some of my. I always tend to gravitate toward movies I like and characters I like, and uh, it's just kind of a fun process. And to me, if I'm if I'm gonna do it again, I'm gonna go all in. Yeah. And my, my wife's not necessarily the same way. She does, she could care less, but sometimes I drag her along like with Trinity. Um, but you know, if you're going to do it, you might as well do it a hundred percent. What is it about those specific characters? I know they're your favorites, but those are, those are some pretty, uh, pretty strong heroes. What are, what is it about those, those characters in particular? Oh, uh, well, Indiana Jones. I mean, that's an easy one. That's one of my favorite movies ever. And you know, the whole adventure, her sense of adventure uh, in that movie is is kind of what fuels me. You know, some of the stuff that I do and some of the trips I go on is, is all part of that adventurous spirit. So I think he really encompasses that. Yeah. Um, Neo is just a badass. <laughs> he is a badass. <laughs> uh, Clint Eastwood, uh, same thing. I mean, just a just a really uh, a great character. And those are great movies. Um, Wild thing, I grew up in Cleveland, so I'm I'm a diehard Cleveland Indians fan, unfortunately. Um so those Loyal. you know that's Loyal and committed. each one has a little bit of different reason. Yeah, I love it. Well, well, you're a badass and uh you're an adventurer and and all of those things. And so it it's it's cool to to see all those things come together and it's cool to see your passion in, in that. I can't wait to see what you're gonna be for Halloween this year. Um, so all of those different actors that, uh, that you've dressed as I am curious because they're going to make a movie about your life someday. So, so Harrison Ford and Keanu Reeves and Hugh Jackman, uh, who's, who's going to be the actor that plays you? Hmm. I actually, I would say Tom Cruise. Nice. I love it. Okay. That works. I love it. So maybe... Tom Cruise. we're probably not too, too different in height. <laughs> <laughs> I love it. So is there, maybe there's a character that, uh, that, that you'll, that you'll be for Halloween one of these years. I'll, I'll wait for that picture. Could um, be. Kevin, what's your movie going to be called? Uh, I think it would be called the Renaissance man. Ooh, the Renaissance man. I love it. Um, that's awesome. Well, listen, I really, really appreciate your time uh, and coming on the show today. I appreciate our friendship over the last 20 years. I appreciate everything that you've done to inspire me to get after adventure and helping me build my John Goddard's list. And maybe I'll, maybe I'll start calling it the Kevin Schoolcraft list instead of the John <laughs> Goddard list. But, uh, so, so final question is if there's people out there that are just kind of inspired by the story and the different adventures and, but they're just not really sure how to get started. And, and maybe they're thinking, gosh, like suffering is not for me. I don't know if I want a mountaineer, but you know, what's your advice for people that, that, that are kind of intrigued by adventure, but maybe feeling a little bit of fear to get started. You know, I would say just, and I'm sure everyone would say, that, just do it. Just find find something small. Take something, you know, if you want to start climbing some high points, find a nice easy one. Find one in your state or find a nice flat one and, and just kind of work your way up. Most of them are, are hikes. Most of them are easy. They're kind of fun to do. You know, if you're if you're going to do a real kind of climb like a like a Rainier, get some professionals, you know call up some guides and, and they, you can learn a lot. You'll meet some really great people and they're, they're really good at what they do and they can help you learn a lot of things that will make you feel much more comfortable about the experience and, you know, take a lot of the fear out of it for you. I love it. That, that is great advice. Well, Kevin, thank you. And uh, for those listening, I hope you have been inspired today as much as I have. I hope that Kevin's story has encouraged you to listen to the voice inside you that calls you to adventure because we want to hear your story next. If you have a story to tell or you need a nudge to create one, please send us an email. And until next time, I want to encourage you to get outside. Thanks for listening. Kevin, thank you for being here. Thanks, Scott. Pleasure.